Take your Bible, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5. We, uh, we're going to be continuing our, our Sermon on the Mount series. So have you enjoyed it so far? All right, good. Uh, so if you haven't been here, we've been taking the Sermon on the Mount and we've been comparing it to uh, Mount Sinai, Moses on Mount Sinai, because Matthew wrote it this way, wrote it down this way, organized it, his story this way, so that we would see the connection. Now, because most of us are not Jewish and most of us don't know our Old Testament very well, we miss a lot of these connections. And uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed doing lately is digging into the Old Testament. I spend a lot of my time in the first five books, what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch is, is the Greek word, but Torah is the he Hebrew word. Uh, I love the Torah. I used to not love the Torah. Okay, anybody ever read Leviticus for fun? No, I've been doing that lately, and I'm actually enjoying it because I'm learning how to understand it properly. And, uh, man, the connections of the Old Testament and the New Testament are numerous. We're intended to read our New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament because that's the story leading up to the Messiah, right? So, um, so I've been kind of showing you this. We've been comparing the two. In the Sermon on the Mount... We're in the laws of the covenant part. So we've already learned about anger and how anger is basically the same as murder because you're essentially murdering someone in your heart. <laughs> I know you don't think of it that way, but that's how Jesus thought of it, and I just go with him. Amen? Yeah, I'll just go with him. Uh, so we talked about that. We've talked about um, lust and how uh, lust is adultery in your heart. We talked about that last week. I don't want to rehash any of that today, so if you can go back online and and watch that. But we're in this laws of the covenant. And what Jesus is doing is he's taking the Ten Commandments, but specifically the last six. And he's quoting it, and then he's kind of reinterpreting that command and offering a more inner ap approach to the commandments of God. So the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, most of these are all external things, right? Especially the last six. These are things that you do with your hands and feet and mouth, whatever. These are the things that you're uh, not supposed to do because they're destructive for you. Now, Jesus is going to take all those things and he's going to turn it inward. It's not just about adultery. It's about a lust problem. It's not just about murder. You actually have an anger and unforgiveness problem. And that's a bigger deal. And that's what leads you to do things like murder or slander. So he's doing this with every single one. Now, the eighth commandment is do not steal in your English Bible. But I did some research on the Hebrew and found out that that word uh, also means deceive. Do not deceive. And that obviously gets translated still in a lot of contexts, depending on the context, because you are being deceptive if you are stealing. Yes? Yes? You ever had anybody steal anything from you? Did you feel like you were deceived? Do you feel like that person was deceptive? Yes. So what Jesus is going to do today is he's going to talk about this strange thing that they practiced back then called swearing an oath. And he's going to call that deception. Now, uh, well, as we dig into it, that'll, that'll make more sense as we go. So uh, let's dig in. You ready? All right, we're going to start in verse 33, chapter 5, verse 33. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now here he's not actually quoting from the Ten Commandments. He's quoting from Leviticus, that book that we all love to read so much. <laughs> Leviticus 19.12, it says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God, because I am the Lord. So he's quoting actually from Leviticus, and he's quoting a little bit from uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, and it's also the same phrase, you shall perform to the Lord what you've uh, sworn. That, in, that appears in Numbers 30, Deuteronomy 23, and Ecclesiastes 5. So this is a very common phrase in the Old Testament. And what Jesus is doing is he's leading them toward what the Eighth Commandment was really about, don't deceive. So he's talking about this idea of swearing falsely. Now, here's what we need to understand. There's nowhere in the Old Testament, at least not that I have found, where God ever commanded anyone to swear an oath. He just says, if you do swear an earth, an, 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 earth, an oath, 
If you do swear an oath, then you must fulfill it, because to not fulfill it would be lying and deceiving. So he never actually commanded anybody to do this thing about swearing oaths. He just says, if you decide to do that, here's what you need to do. Okay, so, but what happened by Jesus' time, when Jesus comes on the scene, the Pharisees, which were basically the teachers of the whole community, they had been teaching people that you must swear an oath, and there's certain things you must swear by. So like in our culture today, we would say things like, and we say silly things like, I swear on my grandmother's grave. You ever said that? Or I swear to God. You've probably done that. You don't want to admit it because you think, you know, where we're at right now is holier than where you're at out there, but you don't want to admit things in here for some reason. We should be most honest in this room. Actually, that's what the sermon's about today is being honest with each other. So they had come up with this idea. They had taken something from the Old Testament, and instead of doing exactly what God said, they kind of changed it into their own thing. And they were saying, if you're going to make any kind of promise, you must swear by something, like by the temple or swear by heaven. Now, what they would not do in Jesus' day, they were afraid to swear by God's name. Because they knew if you swear by God's name and then you don't keep it, God might come kick your hiney. <laughs> so they would not, can you say hiney in here? Is that okay? I expected a laugh. I had to say it twice to get one. Um, anyway, what they would do is they wouldn't swear by God's name because that would really put them at risk. So that what they would do is they would find objects, whether it's in the temple or, or something else, they would swear by those things so they wouldn't be at risk of swearing by God's name. Does that make sense? So we do the same thing. We don't like to swear to God. So what we do is we swear on your life or you swear, I swear on my kids, you know, and all this, which your kids okay with that? <laughs> um, and then you swear on your grandmother's grave. Like what good does that do? Is she coming back to make sure you kept that promise? I don't really understand why we're doing that, right? But what are we doing when we say we swear by all those things? We're trying to add credibility to what we're saying or doing. So if you're telling some, somebody's asking you or accusing you of something and you say, no, I didn't do that, I swear. So we do the same thing. The problem was when Jesus walks on the scene, the Jewish leaders were teaching people to swear by certain things, mainly to swear by things in the temple of God, which is God's house, or it was. Uh, now there's a new temple and it's you and me, right? So there's this idea going around, and they're, they're managing it wrong. If you read ahead in Matthew's gospel to Matthew 23, which is one of my favorite passages, um, Jesus goes after the Pharisees in Matthew 23, and we've already covered that in here some time back, but he goes after these religious leaders who are teaching the wrong things. And there's a whole section in Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22, where uh, Jesus brings up this whole swearing by things in the temple. And he basically says, you're being hypocrites. You think by swearing by something, that somehow makes what you say true. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. You're hypocrites. So um, there's more to be said on this, but what does he say next? He says, but I say to you, look, just don't take an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And don't take an oath by your own head, which is like saying, I swear on my own life. For you cannot make one hair white or black. Now, obviously, this is before they had salons where they could make your hair white or black. Um, <laughs> but what he's saying there is you can't actually change your hair color. So don't swear by your head if you can't even do that part, right? Your, what, is, what he's doing here is he's saying, look, you're getting yourself in all kinds of trouble trying to add credibility to your own deception because you're swearing by something that belongs to God. But the things that belong to God don't belong to you. So it doesn't make any sense to swear by those things. So when we say that when they would say things like, I swear by heaven that what I am saying is true or that I will keep this promise, Jesus would say, um, heaven doesn't belong to you. That's, that's where God's throne is. He's the king of heaven. You, don't, you can't swear by heaven. It doesn't belong to you. Does that make sense? He says, and don't swear by the earth because the earth is his footstool. 
In other words, his throne's in heaven, he's sitting in heaven, and his feet are on the earth. If you go to Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this vision where he gets to peer into heaven, but he starts out in the temple, and he sees the robe that God is wearing, and it's filling the whole temple. But he saw God's face, his body, high and lifted up in the heavens. So it's, it's, it's as if he's sitting in heaven, but he's connected to the earth. He's ruler of heaven, and he's ruler of earth. Earth is like a footstool to him. Actually, in the temple, when you went into the most holy place, there was a box in there called the Ark of the Covenant, and that was considered to be the footstool of God's throne. His feet rested on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That's how they thought of it. That's how God wanted them to think about it. So the earth doesn't belong to us either, so we can't be swearing by the earth as if that's going to add credibility and then Jerusalem, you know, this is the city of the great king. This is He's quoting from uh, Psalm uh, 48, I believe. I've got it in your notes somewhere. 48 verse 2. Uh, so he's saying, look, these things don't belong to you. So for you to swear by these things, to try to add credibility to yourself, actually doesn't make any sense. See what he's doing? But what's the real issue here? The real issue that Jesus wants to deal with is what the Eighth Commandment was dealing with in Exodus 20. Don't be deceptive. Because here's what they were doing. They had found a way, they had devised a way, and the religious experts, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had become experts in loopholes. So what they did is they constantly studied the Scriptures to find ways to get around certain things. Or they would find things that they didn't struggle with, but they wanted, they noticed other people struggle with, so they would make that commandment even harder to keep by adding more commandments on top of it. I call this the hedge effect. So you have God's law, and then they build another law around it like a hedge to keep you from breaking that law, and then that one gets broken, so okay, we need more hedges. So they just keep going out. Before you know it, you've got thousands of pages of laws that weren't actually God's word. They were the traditions of men. So the Pharisees were doing this. What they were doing is they found a loophole like we can be deceptive if we're swearing by some object, we could act, actually add credibility to us even if we're lying about something. That's what's going on. So the real issue here is not necessarily swearing an oath. The issue here is honesty and being truthful. Now, I'll just ask the question, is there some deception in our world today? That's what we really want to talk about this morning. Because the fact of the matter is, our world is full of deception. It, it runs on deception. It's selling you deception all day, every day, isn't it? So we have to be people who live in truth. We're grounded in truth, and we live by truth. You know, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So to live in the truth means we are living in him. We live by his words because we want to not be deceived, and we don't want to be deceivers. This is what Jesus is getting at. Do not be dishonest. Look, here's, here's his solution to the whole problem. He says, look, let what you say be simply yes or no. Now, in Greek, the word simply is not even there. Um, it's implied by how Jesus said this. But in Greek, it says, just let what you say be yes, yes, or no, no. You don't need to add more words to that. Just be honest, right? So, and, and think about it. Isn't it true that... When somebody's trying to say something to you and they're like saying, I swear, I swear, I swear, doesn't that make you suspicious? Because there's something in your mind that goes, why are you having to push this so hard? Why are you having to swear on all this? Why do you have to add all these words? Some of you may think that about my sermons. Why do you have to add so many words? Just cut it short. Yes and no. And go home, right? <laughs> so he says, look, just, look, we can simplify this whole thing. If the answer is yes, say yes. If the answer is no, say no. Well, don't we need to say more than that? And Jesus would say, no, actually, you could do with less words. 
He says, look, anything more than just yes or no comes from evil. And in Greek, it can also mean comes from the evil one. So what he's implying here is there's no need to swear. There's no need to add a bunch of words. Just be truthful. Just tell the truth. Right? Don't, isn't that what we want from everybody? Now, to be honest, there's parts of us that don't want the truth. We'd like things to be softened up a little bit. We'd like things to be kind of sugar-coated. We don't really want the honest truth because the honest truth, let's just be honest here, <laughs> the truth offends you, doesn't it? It's supposed to. The truth is supposed to offend our flesh, our sin nature, our sin problem. What we need to do as believers, as, as the kingdom of God on earth, because that's what we are, we need to be okay with being offended. Couldn't the world use that right now? Everybody everywhere is offended all the time about everything. Wouldn't it be okay if we just said, you know, we're going to live in the truth, even though sometimes that truth hurts our own feelings, we're going to be okay with our feelings being hurt, and we're going to grow up, and we're going to just be God's kingdom on this earth and live in the truth. Imagine what difference we would make if the entire Christian faith, the Christian world in this country would just decide to live by the truth and stop believing the lies that the enemy is telling through our government and through our media and all that. Look, I hope you understand this. You cannot trust your government. You cannot trust your media. If, if, any, if you haven't learned anything over the last two years about this, you should know by now. You can't trust the government, and you can't trust the media. Why? Why? Well, for one, they're working together. And for the other thing is there's some big business corporations that decide what you need to know and what you don't need to know. And they make money off of everything they do. Everything's driven by money and power, right? So I think if Jesus were to be giving this Sermon on the Mount in the climate that we're in today, he would say, look, your world, you are surrounded by deception. You be a person of truth. In the middle of all that deception, you be true. You be honest. <clears throat> Proverbs ten nineteen says this, When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent or wise. When words are many, transgression and sin is right there nearby. And there'll be plenty of it. And then James 5.12, the half-brother of Jesus, he ends up quoting Jesus in his own letter in chapter 5. He says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So even the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't believe that he was the Messiah at first, it took a resurrection to convince James. But then he wrote a letter, and he quotes his older brother and says, look, I know this to be true. Don't be dishonest. Don't be deceptive. Just simply yes or no will do. Be honest. We need this. We need for the church to stand and be founded on the truth, to live by it, and then you can speak it to someone else. So here's what we do. I'm going to get preachy here. Is that okay with y'all? It doesn't matter. I just told you to be okay with being offended. So here we go. <laughs> um, here's, here's the thing. What we do publicly, and I, I don't mean you, I mean Christianity as a whole. Here's what our reputation is in this country. Our uh, denominational leaders or the megachurch pastors or whoever it is that's getting the media attention, they love to yell the truth at people, but they're not actually living like the truth that we follow. His name's Jesus. They don't act like Jesus, but they like to yell the truth out 
to people who don't even believe this yet. So we've gotten it backwards. What we need to do is we need to found our life on the truth, live by it, and then we can have the credibility to speak it to those who don't believe in it yet. We have to live it first. If we're hypocrites screaming at the unbelieving world, we will do nothing but harm. We will not do any good. What we have to do is be people of the truth first in our own lives. And then we have the credibility. Then we have the opportunity to speak into the life of someone else. Because here's what's true. We are about to be the persecuted minority in this country. I don't know how soon it's coming. I'm not a prophet. I'm not making a prophecy right now. But I can tell you it's coming. There are reports now where people are writing articles saying that white evangelicals is the new terrorist threat to this country. Now, you know what happens when people get demonized in the media. People believe it. People run with it. So here's what's coming. I don't know how soon, but here's what's coming. Persecution. And we had better be prepared, and we better be prepared to be people of the truth. Because here's the, here's the other thing that I think is true. There are a lot of people out there that don't even believe what we believe, that are looking at how things are going right now, and even they think it's crazy. Now, guess who those people are going to come to when they need truth? They're going to go to the people who are not crazy who are living by the truth, who are minding their own business, and who are not freaking out about everything that's happening on the news. Those people are going to look around and go, you know, this culture is getting so crazy, and it's like, every, it's like a free-for-all nowadays. Just everybody does whatever they want, unless you want to do something honest and true. That's bad. So those people are going to look at that and see what's going on, and they're going to start looking for people who aren't hypocrites, People who live by the truth and who are not freaking out and have no fear of what's going on. Those, that will be the chance that we have to speak life into someone who doesn't believe what we believe yet. So I've got some passages of scripture that I want to share with you. We're going to have sirens go by for the next 20 minutes. Just get used to it. Okay. <laughs> It's been happening all morning. They got a big fire somewhere. Um, Jesus talked about truth. Uh, obviously, he was the truth, so that's a, pretty much all he did was talk about what's true. Um, but I want to show you some passages that tell us that we have to be people of the truth. We have to live in it. We have to be grounded on it, and then we can speak it to others. But look what he said. Now, this is Jesus talking to a woman at a well. In John chapter 4, this is a Samaritan woman. Jews don't talk to Samaritan women. Jewish men especially don't talk to Samaritan women in that culture. They were enemies. Jesus decides he needs to go through Samaria. I love that about him. He says, no, we're not going to go around Samaria like the Jews always do. We're going to go straight through it. Why did Jesus want to do that? Because he had a woman he knew would be there in the middle of the day, at the day when you don't go draw water because it's too hot. It's like this <laughs> in the middle of the day, right? He goes and meets this woman who's there in the middle of the day because she's ashamed and really can't be around all the other women in town because she's been through a bunch of relationships. Jesus comes to her and has this whole conversation. And if you watch the show, The Chosen, they do this scene beautifully. And he decides, Jesus decides to reveal that he's the Messiah to the most outcast woman he could find. A Samaritan woman who's not a full-blooded Jew, who's been through relationships over and over and over again. She was currently living in sin. And Jesus brings it up. Go get your husband. Let's talk to him. Well, I don't actually have a husband, per se. He has this whole conversation. He ends up revealing that he's the Messiah to her. She's the first one to know 
in that whole region. And they start having a conversation about worship because the Samaritans believe that uh, their, their temple on Mount Gerizim, that's the actual temple, not in Jerusalem. And they, she wants to argue about that. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 look, God is spirit. He's spiritual, which means he can be wherever he wants. You can't lock him in a temple in Jerusalem or in Samaria. Does, God doesn't work like that. God is spirit, and those who worship him or serve him must worship in spirit and in truth. He wants us to worship in spirit, meaning it's something going on in here primarily. Sure, we worship and we serve with our hands and our feet. But primarily, if it's not going on in here, it's inauthentic. So he says you've got to worship in spirit and you've got to do it in truth. This is what he tells this Samaritan woman. This is what God wants. He wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth, not spirit and deception and hypocrisy, truth. In John chapter 8, all these passages, by the way, are from John. I love the Gospel of John. I can't wait to teach you the Gospel of John. Uh, I'm still learning so much about it. In John chapter 8, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. So he's got some Jewish people who have started believing that he's the Messiah. He says, Listen now, if you abide in my word, the word abide means remain, stay in it. If you stay in my word, you are truly my disciples. Truly which implies there were some not-so-truly disciples. You are truly my disciples if you abide, stay in my word, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So a lot of times we're scared of the truth because we think it's going to hurt us. Listen, the truth is the thing that sets you free from your own deception. Amen? Amen? Think about it. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and sick, and you can't even understand your own heart. That's you, and that's me. Your heart wants you to follow it. Don't. Why? Because it doesn't always want to, actually, most of the time, it has no interest in following Jesus. It wants to follow its own desires and pleasures, and it wants you to follow along. Just go along. Your heart is deceitful, but the truth will set you free from that deception that's already in you. It'll set you free. So deception then, if truth sets us free, then deception then is like slavery. We're being enslaved to ourselves, to our own sin nature. See, deception will keep you enslaved, but the truth actually breaks you out of those chains. And sets you free. This is why we must live in the truth. This is why we cannot just stay silent about things in here. I'm not talking about going and beating people up with the truth out there. Listen, if you would work on your own stuff, you wouldn't have time for them out there. The people who are out there don't believe what we believe. It's not our job to convict them of their sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Did you know that? Quit trying to take his job. Right? And, and here's the thing. You're not good at it. I'm not either. You know, we're supposed to speak truth to the people out there. We should be saying, there's a God in heaven who made you, and he loves you so much. And he wants you to turn away from the way this world is going. And turn to him, and he'll set you free. So if you're going to say anything to the world, say that. You know, what, what's going on right now, and look, there's some crazy stuff happening, and I realize that we need to stand on the truth. But can we stand on the truth in here? Can the churches stand on the truth in their churches first? I mean, look, Disney's crazy. All right, let's just talk about it. We might as well. Right? Disney's crazy. You know why they're crazy? Because they're not a Christian company. They're unbelievers. So they're going to do unbeliever type stuff. Right? Okay. What business is it of ours to scream at Disney about acting like who they are? 
Now, we could have a discussion in a room like this and say, you know, let's talk about this Disney thing. Should we be supporting that? What should we do? What shouldn't we do? We can have that discussion. We don't need to get on TV and yell at Disney. If you're mad at Disney, here, here's shocker. Don't go. Well, now they got Disney Plus and they're putting all this on there. Cancel it. No need to yell. Just, I mean, it, you can do it on your remote. I mean, you don't even have to go anywhere. You don't have to make a phone call. You can just click, cancel. End of problem. Look, I don't like anything they're doing right now, especially lately. The guy who plays, who does the voice for um, Buzz Lightyear in the new movie called us all idiots this week. He said, if you disagree with the, the homosexual stuff that we're putting in our films, you all are idiots and you should die off like the dinosaurs. That's what he said. He also is the guy who plays Captain America in the Marvel movies. That's what he says about me and you. Now, I don't need to go yell at him. I don't know him. And I'm not surprised. He works for companies who pay him millions and millions of dollars to go and say things like that about people who disagree with him. I don't care. But you can bet he's not getting my money. I'm not supporting him to call me an idiot. But that's what I'm going to do. I don't need to yell about it. I don't need to boycott them. I hope you realize we can, boy, we can say we're going to boycott somebody all day long. The Southern Baptist Convention met this week, and somebody got up and made a motion to boycott Disney again. I was like, come on, did we not learn anything the last time? Here's the deal. You can say you boycott something, but the majority of the Christians are not going to change what they're doing. So what good did you do? You were a jerk to unbelievers publicly. So we're not going to do that. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to be people of truth. We're going to live by it ourselves. And if the whole world around us crumbles in deception, we will still be standing. And we can wave at those people who are in such a mess in their deception. We can say, hey, we, we got something that can set you free. We have something that can actually set you free from your own deception and from the deception of this world. We would be still standing to do that. John 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and you know he's going to be going away soon. He's going to the cross. He's going to be killed. And he's trying to give them a pep talk. He says, look, when the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all the truth. He'll, he's going to teach you. He'll guide you and teach you. But you remember, now, you have to abide in his word so he can guide you, right? You have to abide in the word and let the Spirit guide you to the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but, he, but whatever he hears, he will speak, meaning the Father's going to tell the Spirit what to teach you. Just like the Father told Jesus what to say and do while he was walking on this earth. He says that he will declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of truth prepares us for what's coming in the future. Did you see that? He's going to declare to you things that are to come. And he's talking to his disciples, the apostles. In context, that's who he's talking to. But I think the principle here applies to us as well. If we live in the truth and we abide in his word and we get all of the truth we can into our system, into our mind, into our heart, he will prepare us for what's coming. Listen to me, church. We need to be prepared we might be coming up on some of the most difficult times we've ever seen. Food shortages have not even began. It's going to get rough. Nobody in Washington right now is concerned about how much it costs you to fill up your car. You know what they're concerned about? Buy an electric vehicle. They're pushing that as hard as they can. Who do you think's paying them to say that? 
It's deception. Electric vehicles, sure, they work great until they don't. And by the way, the machine that digs up the dirt to make the lithium batteries burns a thousand gallons of diesel fuel a day. It's a lie. It's deception. You want to buy a, you want to buy a Tesla? Fine, go buy a Tesla. I'm not saying you're stupid for doing that. Go do it. Have a good time. I'm just saying the whole idea that that's going to fix anything is deception. It, all that is is business advertising, what they're doing. They're not concerned about you. The people who are running the show are not concerned about us, and they're especially not concerned about Christians. We've got hard times coming. If I were you, I would be in places like this, where we're sitting today, every chance you can get. Because we need to prepare ourselves for what's about to happen. And it might not happen to us, but it might happen to our kids. We might be at the end of our life before we see all these events really turn up. And the question will be, how well did we prepare our children? He'll prepare us for what's to come, but you've got to stay in the truth, stay with the Spirit. John 17, this is Jesus' uh, high priestly prayer for us. Do you know Jesus prayed for you? You should go read John 17 and read what he prayed for you. Now, I, I really like the fact that Jesus prays for us. This is so exciting to me because the Father likes to answer your prayer. Yes? He likes to give you good things. How much more does he answer the prayer of his only begotten son who gave his life for the world? And Jesus prayed a prayer for us. He prays for his disciples in John 17, and then he says, now I want to pray for those who will believe in my name through the disciples' message. That's us. Here's what he says during that, that prayer. Sanctify them, those who believe, in the truth. Your word is truth. Let me just do a little mini sermon right here. This is truth. Stuff you find on here is probably deception. This is truth. You say, okay, yeah, we already know that. Why aren't you reading it every day of your life? This is absolute, accurate truth directly from the Spirit of God to us. Amen? Aren't you glad we have this? I mean, if we didn't have this, here's what you'd be left to. You'd be left to a bunch of pre preachers and so-called prophets to tell you what God thinks. I don't know about you. If in the last couple of years hadn't taught us anything, the internet prophets have been wrong. Over and over, all of them said Trump was going to get reelected. They were all wrong. And guess what happened to their ministries? Nothing. They're still going on strong and people are paying them left and right. My Bible says if you're a prophet and you're wrong, you're not a prophet. Okay, end of sermon. Your, your word is truth. His word is truth. This is why, and I, look, I know you're not me and you're not doing the job that I do, but I don't have any problem sitting in this all day. I cannot get enough of it. And I'm not saying you got to be exactly like me and stick your nose in this thing all day long, every day. But if I were you, here's what I would do if you want to be prepared for what's coming, whatever that is. I would be reading this when I got up in the morning. I would be listening to it on my way to work because, you know, the YouVersion app will actually read the Bible to you. Please don't read it on your phone while you're driving to work <laughs> for the rest of us' sake, okay? But it will actually read the Bible to you. I know a bunch of people who do this. When they're driving to work, they're listening to the Word of God. I, my wife does this all the time. I, I hear Suzanne listening to, to people read the Scripture or talk about the Scripture on a regular basis. And when I'm not reading it, I'm listening to it. I listen to people do podcasts. I listen to the Bible Project podcast. You should try that out. It is awesome. Two guys, a Hebrew scholar and a not-at-all scholar, <laughs> have a discussion about the Bible, and it is awesome. You will learn so much about your Bible you didn't know. And it, all of this puts truth inside of our mind, and it renews our mind. The Apostle Paul said this, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of the world? Deception. 
Don't be conformed to that. Don't go along with that. Conform means get in line with. Don't get along with that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You read this as much as you possibly can. You come to places like this and learn all you can. Because it's truth. This is the only thing solid in this world. Right? There's a lot of things on shaky ground all over the place. This is the rock that we stand on. It will not lead you astray. It will lead you to truth because it is truth. It was written by the truth himself. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for they, their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Sanctify. That's a churchy word, isn't it? Sanctification. I'll simplify it for you. You don't need to read a theology book on it. I got you. Sanctification means being set apart and changed for a purpose. Jesus prayed that you would be different in the world around you. You would have a purpose in this world. He prayed that they'd be sanctified in truth so he could send them out to do something. And you know what? That prayer was answered. Those 12 guys, well, it ended up being 11 one didn't turn out so hot. Those 12 guys, along with the Apostle Paul who got added later, changed the entire world. They gave their lives for it. They crucified Peter upside down after they killed his wife in front of him. They chopped Paul's head off in Rome not long after they had crucified Peter. Uh, James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder, they arrested him. You can read about this in the book of Acts. They arrested him and they put him to death. And then they let John and Peter go. And John and Peter left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. That's a different version of Christianity, isn't it? Follow Jesus, you might die. Nobody gives that invitation at the end of church, do they? <laughs> Follow Jesus. You might get your head cut off. Rejoice. But that day's coming for us. It's coming for somebody in the future. But we're going to be the people who get chased down and persecuted. But see, here's the thing. I'm not so worried about that because I know another one who's chasing me. Psalm 23, surely his goodness and mercy will chase me all the days of my life. So I don't give a flip if Joe Biden comes chasing me. He's probably going to fall. I mean that figuratively and literally. <laughs> I don't care if this American government, which has become so God-awful corrupt, comes chasing us down because I know the other one who's also chasing me down. And he wins every time. Even if I die in the process, I win. Read the book of Revelation. The ones who overcome died for their faith, and Revelation calls that overcoming. That's upside down, isn't it? No, overcoming means we won and they died and we lived. It's not the way Jesus sees it. When you give your life up for him, you actually won the battle. Why? Because you, in, in dying, you get released from a body that wants you to sin all the time, and you get released from a culture full of sin, and you get to go be in God's perfect face-to-face -face presence. You won. This is why the Apostle Paul said, you know what, I'm, I'm conflicted. I, I really want to go be with Christ. But also know that as long as I'm here on this earth, I'm doing things that he's called me to do. So I'm conflicted. I want to stay and do what he's called me to do, but I'd also rather be with him in his presence face to face. That is the kind of Christianity we need. I really would rather go be with Christ face to face, but as long as I'm here and I'm sucking air, 
I've got a job to do, and I do want to do his job. I want to do his work on this world and on this earth. I want to reach my family members and coworkers and students and all of these people that need him desperately who are bound by deception. I want to set them free. But, but man, I sure like to be up there saying, worthy are you. That's the kind of Christianity this world needs true disciples who worship him in spirit and truth and who are sent into the world to make a difference. And when I say make a difference, I don't mean we're going to fix the government. The government's a worldly kingdom. Guess what worldly kingdoms do? They eat themselves from the inside out. Greed And immorality is going to tear this place apart. But it cannot touch you. If you are in Christ, you belong to him. We are a different kingdom. We play by different rules. We're reading a different playbook. So if I I scared you at all, I tend to do that to people. I don't mean to scare you about what's coming. In the book of Revelation, Jesus tells them over and over again, bad days are coming, bad days are coming. Every time he says, fear not, for you will overcome. In this world you will have trouble, that's a promise Jesus told us. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Because he overcomes, we do. So I'm not worried. Are you worried? If you are worried, stay tuned. Because if you flip the page in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. So we'll get there soon. (laughs) But don't worry. Worldly kingdoms rise and fall. It's been happening since the beginning of time. But the kingdom we're in cannot be shaken. Read Hebrews. We have come to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's who, that's who you are. That's who I am. There's three forms of deception. I'm not going to spend time on this, but there's, there's telling lies and living a lie. So you're the one doing the deception. Or there's believing lies from the outside. You're watching the news. You're just going right along, believing everything they tell you. And then there's self-deception. And self-deception is the hardest form to see. You can't see it. Someone has to see it for you. This is why we need this family that we've got going on. Someone's deceiving their self. We get to step in and go, hey, I think you're lying to yourself. We help each other get out of our own deception. Because self-deception is the most destructive. So before we blame the world for being deceptive, just remember, you are going to tear you apart worse than anybody else is going to. Right? So here's what I think we should do as we end today. All right? I'm through. I think we should do what David did. We should pray this prayer. We're going to spend some time uh, praying, communions here, spend some time worship, worship him, take communion, but I want us to be praying this prayer. Okay? So I'm going to ask Suzanne if she will come play for me, and uh, we'll sing in just a minute. This is what David wrote, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, which means test me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's a good prayer, isn't it? It's also a dangerous prayer. You're asking God to expose who you really are in here. Now, we don't have hundreds of people in the room right now, but even in a crowd this size, some of us surely are deceiving ourselves in some way. So I think the best thing we could do is just do what David did. 
let's pray this prayer together. Just individually where you're at. Search me, God. Help me know what's in my heart. Help me to see where I'm fooling myself. See if there's something sinful, grievous in here. And lead me in your way. Not my own way, my deceptive way. Lead me in the way of righteousness. That's a good prayer, isn't it? So I'm going to invite you just right where you are to bow your head and spend a moment praying this prayer. And let's see what God might reveal to us. And then we'll sing in just a moment. Okay, so just right where you sit, start praying.